In this video I'm going to talk about the cultivation of fungi on organic wastes, about the production of environmentally sustainable and biodegradable materials from mycelium, and about the potential medicinal uses of fungi. According to Australia's National Waste Database, every year we produce around 67 million tonnes of waste, of which 27 million tonnes ends up in landfill. Of that waste, 9 million tonnes is organic. We also produce another 10 million tonnes of farm waste every year. What if instead of disposing of organic waste, we could use it to lower our greenhouse gas emissions while sustainably producing food, medicine and biodegradable products to re replace plastic? Well, the solution might be the humble mushroom. Fungi are decomposers, which means they can be grown on organic waste. They can grow on pretty much any type of organic waste, including farm waste, sawdust, dung, paper, and even liquid wastes. Some fungi can even break down petroleum products, which means they would be ideal for bioremediation. The mushrooms in this photo were grown by the mycologist Paul Stemmets on an oil-contaminated straw. In 2010, a plastic decomposing fungus was discovered by Yale students when it consumed the petri dish it was in. The process of growing fungi starts with a spore or a tissue sample. This is grown onto a clean agar or liquid culture under sterile conditions. The culture is used to inoculate sterile grain or seed to make spawn. Once the spawn has fully colonised, it is used to inoculate a pasteurised bulk substrate such as straw or wood. The final stage is fruiting the mushrooms. This happens in humid conditions at the right temperature for the particular species. The whole process of growing mushrooms from beginning to end takes about two months. Fruiting takes about four days. In order to find out more about industrial scale mushroom farming, I spoke with Tyler Cameron, who's the manager and owner of a mushroom farm, Umami Umami. Hey, I'm Tyler. I'm the manager at Umami Umami. We're a new gourmet mushroom farm uh, in Melbourne. We supply, at the moment, about 100 kilos of fresh gourmet mushrooms to chefs all over Melbourne. So because we're getting our bags on such quick cycles from our supplier, down in Karen Downs, it's usually there, but usually only had about 13 days incubation uh, with him. So we needed our own incubation space here, particularly uh, for our king oysters, which we find they need another two or three weeks of incubation on top of the initial two weeks which we'd usually have for our standard oyster mushroom species. So most of our oysters, our standard kind of sorrows oyster, after 14 days it will be fully colonised and you can pretty much cut that straight open and put it in the fruiting room. But with king oysters we really need to, to really over colonise them before they're ready for fruit and get really good pig sets. Uh, same goes for shiitake, these actually need to be colonised for about 3 months, about 90 days, before they're ready to go into the fruiting room. So these were inoculated on the 16th of the 1st, and we're moving these into the fruiting room over the next fortnight. So we keep this room in here between 22 to 23 degrees. Uh, we could probably push that up to 25 at a maximum if we need to things to run faster. And the same goes uh, with principles in the fruiting room, the, the, the kind of warmer the temperature up to a limit, the faster they grow. And it's about finding that really good balance, about really consistent growth rates. commercial grow room I ever set up um, and it's just constant constant tweaking. <laughs> the most important things we have to consider with a grow room are 
fresh air intake, which is coming in through this fan with a diffuser down here. Uh, high humidity, which you can't see, but we've got a duct piping in humidity from a fogger that's situated outside of the grow room, and lights. A lot of people are under the uh, misconception that mushrooms grow in the dark. We actually want to use light. It helps uh, trigger the pin set, and mushrooms will grow towards the light and also uh, it will create deeper hues on the mushrooms, particularly the blue oyster mushrooms. They really love it nice and bright in the grow room. Research that would be useful for the mushroom industry includes developing faster growing, disease resistant and higher yielding strains of mushrooms. Developing spore free strains would help reduce the health problems such as spore lung in the industry. Finding ways to make use of waste mycelium would reduce waste and cost to farmers. So once your mushrooms have grown out, um, you're left with this block and you can see there's a couple of mushrooms still on there, but you're left with this white stuff, which is the mycelium. Um, it's quite solid and it's also quite lightweight. Now this can be grown to pretty much any shape, depending on what shape container you grow it in. And once it's grown out, it can be dried out and it can be used for building materials, for insulation, for packaging, any kind of lightweight applications to replace plastics or styrofoam. In 2014, this tower was created in New York as an arts installation using 10,000 biodegradable mycelium composite bricks. It remained in place for three months before being taken down. Studies have also found that mycelium composites are effective as thermal insulation as well as fire and sound insulation. Mycelium can make a lightweight packaging material and is already being used by some companies. There are multiple approaches to creating mycelium composites. The substrate they are grown on can affect the properties of the composite. For example, adding waste glass to increase the fire resistance. Different organic substrates are also found to produce different sound absorbing qualities and surface textures. Using reinforcement, for example sandwich fabrics or bioresins, can it also affect the strength of the material. While most mycelium composites are grown to the shape of their container, other approaches such as 3D printing have been successful. So this chair was made by Eric Clarenbeek by 3D printing powdered straw and mycelium and then allowing that to grow out. And it shows how even very complex shapes can be made using mycelium. Future directions for research include resistance to pests and environmental degradation and ways to increase the strength of composites. It would also be useful to see how different species perform on different types of agricultural waste and their effect on material properties. Increasing the scale and speed at which mycelium composites can be manufactured is also important for commercial production. Next we speak to Amanda Morgland, who's the owner of Mycelium Made and recently completed her honours degree at RMIT in the Bachelor of Fashion Design, studying how fungi could make the fashion industry more sustainable. Uh, so in the textile industry, it is estimated that by 2030, uh, there will be 148 million tonnes of textile waste produced. Uh, this was estimated by the Global Fashion Agenda, who produced the Pulse Report uh, last year, which is a overview of how the industry is performing uh, in order to assess what we can do to begin tackling some of these uh, really big problems. So when it comes to textile waste, it's a really nutritious source uh, for mushrooms to grow on. This is oyster mushrooms just growing on cotton scrap. Um, in the process of growing the root network, it actually weaves together uh, previously unusable uh, sc scraps of textiles. So when we look at uh, things like manufacturing, uh, between 10 and 15 percent of yarns used to produce clothing automatically hits the cutting room floor just from things like pattern making. Um, and they're shredded, so they're too small to really be incorporated into a textile of quality. Uh, but this offers us an alternative method uh, to uh, reuse 
these things as valuable resources and uh, keep them in the supply chain. Uh, the other type of material that we have available with mushrooms is uh, mushroom leather. Um, so this material has several advantages um, above traditional leather materials in that we don't need to chemically tan it. Um, it, you know, grows fairly rapidly uh, compared to uh, raising uh, a cow, for example. Um, and treatment of it is uh, just simply drying it out. Uh, it's got uh, antimicrobial qualities and it is water wicking, so it's really ideal for use against the skin. Um, this is the exact sort of quality that we want from our textiles uh, that we're using inside our clothes. Um, also, it's got a really lovely uh, texture, it kind of feels a bit like velvet. So I think this really has the potential to revolutionise the fashion industry uh, throughout the entire supply chain. Um, if we embrace the collaboration with fungi, we could have an industry that looks much healthier um, and is more rewarding for everyone involved. Mushroom leather is produced from the fruiting body of the wild polypore Phalinus ellipsoideus. While mushroom leather has been produced for decades, there have been no scientific studies on the physical properties of the leather and no studies on cultivating the fungus. Ecovative has also produced a type of mushroom leather from mycelium, but it requires a mesh framework. Mushroom leather provides many opportunities for future research, particularly in finding ways to produce it from mycelium or through cultivation or from different species. Fungi have been used in traditional medicine for thousands of years for almost any purpose you can think of. Commonly used medicinal mushrooms include reishi, or Ganoderma lucidum, turkey tail, or Trimetes versicolor, lion's mane, or herisium species, and cordyceps. Some species, such as Cordyceps militaris, are so highly sought after that they are worth more than gold. In recent years, many scientific studies have looked into the medicinal effects of mushrooms. This chart shows just some of the medicinal properties that are commonly found in a wide variety of mushrooms. Of course, fungi are also an important source of antimicrobials. Penicillin was named after the penicillium mould it was developed from. Unfortunately, we are not only seeing a rise in antibiotic resistance, but the amount of new antibiotics being found each year is declining. The red line shows the percentage of bacteria resistant to last resort antibiotics in US hospitals, while the blue bars show the number of new antibiotics launched in the time period. The black line shows the average trend in new antibiotics is being launched is continually decreasing. Fortunately, macrofungi have great potential for the discovery of new antibiotics. For example, in this picture, a zone of inhibition can be seen around a tissue sample from a Lepista nuda mushroom, suggesting that it contains powerful antimicrobials. There has been little research on Australian fungi, with only 24% of our estimated 50,000 species of native fungi having been described. Future directions include looking for new antimicrobials, as well as researching the medicinal potential of Australian native fungi. For example, several Australian native cordyceps species are known to have similar cancer-fighting compounds to other medicinal cordyceps. There is also potential to produce non-allergenic and antimicrobial wound dressings from fungi or from fungal chitin. In conclusion, fungi could be the solution to many of our problems stemming from organic wastes as well as petroleum-based products. They show great potential to revolutionise a wide variety of industries, ranging from farming to construction, packaging, fashion and medicine.